Hello and welcome to this video. My name's Chris, I'm an Australian GP, but today I'm not talking to you as a GP, I'm talking to you as me, just Chris. <laughs> this is a really hard video to make, but I feel like it's a really important one. Um, two months ago, I had a miscarriage and during the whole process, I found myself turning to YouTube and people's videos on YouTube to find a sense of connection, understanding, which was really hard because as a doctor, I deal with miscarriage regularly. And I talk to patients about miscarriage frequently and I see it and I walk with people through those journeys, but to experience it myself was something I didn't think I ever would have to do. And I, when it did happen, I didn't know how to react. And there is no right or wrong way to react, but it, it's been hard. So what I want to do today is just walk you through my story, not to garner sympathy, not to garner comments or, you know, I, I just want another story out there so at least one person feels less alone if they go through something similar. So for context, I'm 29. I've never been pregnant. And my husband and I found out we were pregnant in March and it was very wanted <laughs> and was very exciting. The way that I told him is a throwback to a YouTube series we loved watching together, which was the 100 Baby Challenge by <laughs> Kelsey and BGK, who originally was at BuzzFeed. Anyway, and she would constantly exclaim like, I'm eating for two. And so I had it in my mind years ago when we started watching that, that that's how I was going to tell my husband was one day I was going to sit down at dinner and have the two plates and say they're both for me because I'm eating for two. So I did that <laughs> and it was very exciting. And I tried to film it, but all you can see is like from our busts down, it was just a mess, but it was really awesome. So I found out just before I was four weeks pregnant because I was tracking and I was excited. <laughs> so about a week later, I started getting a brown discharge, which sent me into a spiral of panic even though I know logically a little bit of brown discharge is super normal in pregnancy. The progesterone levels soften the cervix if there's a little bit of old blood there, if you'd had intercourse, like there's so many reasons that could have happened, but it just sent this fear through me. It settled, thankfully. Um, so that's when I was about four and a half weeks pregnant. When I was just under six weeks pregnant, we had an incident where I was at work and I was doing a skin check on a patient and she commented that there was some blood on the floor and I made a joke being like ah oh, that was my last skin patient you know just trying to because I couldn't figure it out until she left and I realized actually that was from me yeah it was from me so I went to the bathroom and so much blood and I panicked as you'd understand but I still had half a day to go at work and I'm fully booked and I'm always a couple of weeks booked in advance and I didn't want to let anyone down so I continued so I worked and I got home and I told my husband that I feared I was having a miscarriage and so I ended up calling the uh, imaging place and they were so kind and they said come straight in oh, sorry so I went straight in and they did an ultrasound and I was still pregnant the sonographer did say um, as well that I had what's known as a subchorionic hemorrhage or subchorionic hematoma which is where the placenta embedding in the uterus there's some bleeding there and so I had quite a large one I think and I, I could pull up the scans again I think it was about seven mil and that's where the bleeding was coming from and it was in, I guess, imprinting or it was a touching and abutting against the gestational sac. So my sac looked irregular, but so baby was still there. Baby was measuring maybe a few days less than I thought I was from the day I tested, but that's not like abnormal or uncommon. And so I was told, come back in two weeks and we'll scan you again, because that would put me at just under eight weeks. So great. I stopped bleeding, didn't stop panicking.
I'm so confused and so scared and it's so hard because medically I know I know all the facts I know you know 20 to 30 percent of pregnancies end in loss like you know one in three one in four I know it's early I know it's probably easier now than it would be later like nine to twelve weeks I know I'm still young I'm under 30 so and I know we got pregnant in the first few cycles so they were awful I know all of this but it doesn't make it easier and the worst thing is I'm holding on to tiny hope because my beta HCG is where it should be and I've seen like subchorionic hemorrhages and other uterine bleeds that go to have normal pregnancies and I don't know what I saw yesterday because I was just so scared and like I'm not an expert I'm not a radiologist I'm not an obstetrician all I can do is watch and wait and it's torture taking today off work because I'm just like this I'll be fine and then I'll just cry but at this point my symptoms were worsening with every day the fatigue I felt like I'd been hit by a truck my breasts were so tender like just brushing them putting on and taking off bras was just so uncomfortable um the nausea was building I'd get waves of it and like I had reflux like I had all these symptoms and then I started experiencing like sleep disturbance and if you've seen any of my personal videos before I've had insomnia and I sort of went well maybe it's the stress maybe it's not long story short I just felt pregnant and I continue to feel pregnant. So now we fast forward and I'm just under seven weeks at six weeks plus five, depending yeah, depending on which date you use. I was about six plus five, six plus six. And again, I was at work and I just finished a consult and I felt this enormous pressure in my pelvis. And I thought, oh no, I'm bleeding again. And I went to the toilet and I passed a massive clot. I'm talking about this big, like, egg. After I passed the big clot, I did bleed a little bit. And again, I freaked out. And I still had patients to see, so I still went to work. And I texted my husband that I thought I just passed our baby. It's me again, looking exhausted. Um, I don't really know why I'm updating. I haven't had much bleeding since yesterday. Definitely no more big clots. I had two more little clots. Painless still. I had my first ever wake up at 2 a.m. experience. Mm. I was feeling so nauseous and I just could not go back to sleep. So I got up and ate. <laughs> it was only a couple of biscuits, like just plain crackers, but yeah. And was able to go back to sleep. I woke up and I was like so sure that my pad was going to be full of blood and clots, but nothing. Um, again, like I said, painless still. Still having waves of nausea, boobs are still sore, and like I keep checking, I'm like, yep, still sore. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading and like Googling, and every medical journal I read says that this is not a good sign. Although, reassuring about the raising beaters but unless we see heartbeat it's still a high chance that this is miscarriage and that I've miscarried or I'm imminently about to but then I read all of these non-medical just like people's experiences blogs and things and I'm like no oh, I had massive bleeds and I passed clots and I thought I passed my whole baby and then nope there was babies there or it was a polyp which I know mine's not a polyp and then I found out I had twins like so, it's hard. I hate seeing the blood. And, like, it's naturally worse whenever I go to the toilet. And, of course, I'm peeing a lot more because I'm pregnant. And I know that's natural because it's position and it's pulled blood and stuff. But, like, every time my stomach churns, I'm like, is that a cramp? Am I about to start cramping? Is this it? This is 
an awful experience. And so <laughs> I did the same thing as last time and I ended up getting another ultrasound appointment at 6 plus 6. And our baby still had a heartbeat, or had a heartbeat for the first time. And that was such an exciting and reassuring thing. And I saw it. I saw it first, or at least I saw it before the sonographer said she did. And she probably saw it. And I felt reassured. I thought, you know what, we've got a fighter. Um, and that the, the subchorionic hemorrhage that I had was now much smaller and so I thought maybe I just passed that. The sac still looked irregular but you know I I guess I was cautiously optimistic at this point. Uh, yesterday was probably the best and the worst day so far. Um, had my ultrasound in the morning and we saw baby's heartbeat. <laughs> we saw that my bleed has shrunk um, it's now two mil, um, and I physically am spotting a lot less, which is excellent. The sac is still really irregular, which could be that the bleed's still pushing on it, could be a really bad sign, and baby's heart rate was really low, um, 90, where it should be 110 minimum. Um, there's... A possibility it's because the heart's just formed um, and that it's really early it was so amazing I saw it I just burst into like I just sobbed on the table which was really hard because she's trying to ultrasound and I'm trying to say still with every gasp I'm like moving but I saw it flickering it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen um, but I got a bit of a blow when I found out my Beta HCG is not rising very fast at all, but I mean, initially it just floored me, and I convinced myself I'm gonna lose this baby, and I've gone through like flip flopping <laughs> between thinking I'm gonna lose this baby and thinking I'm not. For the last two weeks, like it has been the longest two weeks of my life, but um, so my beta HCG has gone. 703, 1,400, then I didn't test for a little while, for, no, it was 1,330, whatever, like it doubled, fine. Looking back, I thought I was four weeks, I would have still been in the three-week mark, if not early four weeks, so fine. Then I went from 14 to 20, so 14,000 to 20,000, which wasn't quite double, but fine and then 20 to 30, and then 30 to 40. So we haven't doubled in a week. As in, within the week we've not had a double. But when I sat down and thought about it, if I was to continue doubling exponentially by, I think it's going to be two days from now, my beta HCG would be half a million. And the highest it should be by the lab that I go through at any point, and in this instance it's up to eight weeks, is a quarter of a million, 250,000. So it cannot double exponentially forever. So I fluctuated between being devastated that we're not doubling and that, you know, it's a sure sign that this is not going to work to being relieved and full of hope again. I've started telling people at work because I don't know my availabilities in the next ever. And every morning I wake up and I'm like, are oh, my boobs still sore? Because <laughs> I don't really have any other symptoms. I'm tired, but I'm always tired. <laughs> like, this isn't new for me. This is just a bad week, you know. I'm nauseous, but then I wonder if it's I'm just getting hungry. I'm so excited for next week's scan. Because if Bob has heartbeat and it's faster, then I will be much more reassured that things are going okay. But I'm terrified for next week's scan because... If there's no heartbeat or it's still slow, it's imminent miscarriage, as I've been suspecting and fearing the last two weeks. <laughs> so, well, the last week, I should say. It's really, it's been a week. It's been a long, awful week. I mean, everyone is essentially saying, like, I'm allowed to grieve, as if 
they've given up on it too. And I suspect, I suspect and suppose it's because it's better to be cautious and be guarded than it is to be optimistic and then be shattered. So I get that. I mean, it's really hard because I've not really had anyone say, there's a chance it'll be okay. And that's all I want to hear. And all I want to be true. Even though I know it's probably not true. <laughs> and so we decided to book in for one more scan in a week's time, when I would have been eight weeks. And, you know, get that reassurance and then not have a scan for a month and go on a normal pregnancy journey. And I felt so sick. <laughs> I felt so nauseous. I had food, like, I wasn't having cravings or aversions, but, like, food just didn't sound good. I was using, like, lozenges to try and reduce the nausea. I had snacks. I was getting up in the middle of the night to eat because I was so nauseous. Again, my boobs were so sore, so I still felt so pregnant. And I had at this point told a couple of people at work um, because I was not wholly there when I was there because I was sick or I was panicking or, at you know, I'd had two days off because of what had happened. And then I booked my last scan at seven plus six like weeks on a Friday afternoon thinking that if it was bad I'd have the weekend and if it was good I'd have the weekend and when they put the the probe on my belly there was no heartbeat anymore so if our baby had died at some point in the last week and it's the worst pain I've ever felt <laughs> I don't know how we pulled through that weekend. So on the Monday, I got in touch with my doctor, who got in touch with an obstetrician, who said, if you want, we can manage this surgically today. So I had given a lot of thought to what I wanted to do. Um, you can wait for your body to figure out that baby has passed and then physically passed baby. But I was feeling sicker with every day and more pregnant with every day. So I didn't want to wait. And then with medical management, I was scared of the pain and I was scared of the negative association with blood, which is ironic because all the blood I'd had was at a time when baby was fine <laughs> and I didn't bleed when baby died. So I opted to have a DNC and dilatation and curatage. And so I had that when I was eight weeks and two days pregnant, even though technically I wasn't pregnant with a live baby anymore. The surgery was fine. I was very numb emotionally. I had a very big out of body experience when I walked into the theatre because I've been on the anaesthetic side, I've been on the obstetric side, but I've never been on the patient side of this kind of surgery. I've had wisdom deep and tonsils out and stuff, but this felt so different. The last thing I said was goodbye baby. I woke up and I was no longer with baby. <laughs> I went home and I went and had a shower and went to bed because I was exhausted. <laughs> but the, the nap from the anaesthetic was great. <laughs> I always said that, that anaesthetics are the best naps. <laughs> So I didn't go to work for a week and I didn't feel like a person for that week. I was very emotional, like this, <laughs> and I would cry at the drop of a hat and just a thought, but in the following days my nausea disappeared, my breast stopped hurting, I was still tired but I think that was more of an emotional grief, it wasn't the same bone heavy tiredness. And yeah, I was no longer pregnant. I went back to work a week later. So I had, you know, Monday through Friday off, went back Monday. And it was such a hard day. My emotional capacity for people was severely reduced. I still did my very best and I still did my best to be empathetic and sympathetic and to be kind 
and to take everyone's problems as as big as they were for them just because someone's situation didn't feel as crappy as mine didn't mean that to them it wasn't the biggest thing so I did keep that very like prominent and tried to be very mindful it got easier as the week went on I just didn't feel like myself I had no time for jokes or to hear people talk negatively about their kids or daycare or the things that I perceived I wasn't going to have. It took about two weeks before I felt more like myself. All the while, I continued to test positive on a pregnancy test. And this is not uncommon. Um, it could be a week to six weeks on average from the experience I found in the communities I'm in. They were slowly reducing, which is good, as in they were getting less bold on their tests. And then I had my OB appointment and we did an ultrasound. It showed maybe a little bit of retained product, but most likely just some mucus with some bleeding. But at that point, I stopped bleeding. I barely bled after my DNC. I had no pain. It was great. <laughs> the OB noticed I didn't have any signs of follicular stimulation, which again is not uncommon, especially because I was testing positive. Um, Timeline-wise, this takes us to mid-April. So in May, a few weeks after I had my DNC, I got COVID <laughs> and that sucked. I'm going to do a whole other video on my experiences with COVID, um, but one thing that COVID did is it brought back my period and it was the most horrific period I've ever had. I, as a medically trained person with an interest in women's health, laid on the floor and contemplated calling an ambulance. I think the worst of it was the shock. <laughs> I didn't expect to have the experience I did. So we were sitting at dinner and I felt this really sharp stab in my gut. And it's not uncommon for me. I do have IBS. But I hadn't eaten anything I knew was a trigger for me. And then I sort of felt warmth. So I thought, oh, my period's here. Great. So I went to the toilet and I'd hardly sat down before I started passing huge clots and a lot of it. And this is disgusting, but the only way I can describe it is I had diarrhea, but it wasn't fecal matter or from my bowels. It was from my vagina. I was losing uterine matter in a cascade that was like diarrhea. It was mixed with, it was clots mixed with blood and the pain legitimately floored me. So I was on the toilet and I had to ask my husband to bring me a towel to hug against my lower abdomen to try and reduce the pain. And when I felt I had finally passed the majority of the clots, I just had this feeling of I need to get into a shower. I was in that much pain, I felt like throwing up. And I just felt awful and of course emotional because what I experienced, I can only imagine, is similar to what it is like to have a medical or an expected miscarriage or medical termination or anything like that. And I had tried so hard to avoid it. And I didn't. <laughs> there was a part of me that thought that maybe I had retained products because, like I said, at the ultrasound scan, there was some sort of mucus mixed with blood still in my uterus, but we thought that was fine. I went to the toilet and, oh, sorry, I went to the shower and just laid on the floor in the fetal position with hot water on my back for a while and thankfully it soothed and eventually I made it to the couch. Um, my husband used a chair like this to actually wheel me from one end of the house to the other because taking steps was just so painful. And I had two heat packs <laughs> and some pain relief that I'd had on hand for COVID <laughs> and I eventually got to sleep. That bleeding lasted seven days um, and came and went with clots but now I'm more confident it wasn't retained products it was returned to menstruation which was horrific and that's where I am now. I am now in another cycle. I am two months out from the miscarriage that I lost at two months so it has been a wild ride. I certainly have more sympathy and empathy for women 
and partners and anyone undergoing pregnancy loss. It was a club I never wanted to join, but I did. <laughs> I know it's, it's hard because I'm sitting here and I want to put my doctor hat on and now I'll tell you like the stats are one in three pregnancies and a miscarriage and it's never your fault and that nothing I did caused my subarach, subarach? <laughs> nothing I did caused my subchorionic hemorrhage, subarach's a brain bleed. <laughs> I don't have pregnancy brain anymore so I can't blame that I want to sit here and tell you you know that it'll be okay and whatnot but as me Chris the person it hurt so much without my husband I wouldn't have been able to get through this and the support of my family and friends um I journaled a lot and it tried to process things because even though I know everything medically I blamed myself I hated my body for failing me at something that's supposed to be so natural and I found myself envious of women who were pregnant that I was angry at people who found out they were pregnant and didn't want to keep the baby even though my uterus has no bearing on theirs and their decision is wholly theirs and I'm so supportive of like choice um, a provider of choice like it's just it took a while for me to be able to separate so if you are going through something similar, hold space for your grief. Know that it's okay to feel everything you feel. Yeah, that's my miscarriage story. I found out I was pregnant. I had two lots of significant bleeds in the first seven weeks. At eight weeks, I found out I was no longer pregnant with a live baby. At eight weeks, I had my DNC. And then two months later, no, it would have been a month later. I'm so sorry. Thinking back, I'm wrong, it was a month later I had my period. It just, this year has been a big blur. <laughs> my return to having a period was horrific. And please know there are great resources out there to support you if you are going through the same thing as me. You're not alone. There are so many of us out there who have experienced this kind of grief. Because it's a grief of the pregnancy. It's a grief of the future. I thought I would have a baby at Christmas. I thought that I could be a mother for Mother's Day. I thought I would have a baby the same year as people I know who are pregnant. I had already in my head rearranged this room, which is my office, into a baby's nursery. I had already thought about how exciting it'll be to bring a baby home, to watch them grow up to see what kind of person they'd be in the future, to watch my parents be grandparents, my family more as well, and that got taken away from me. But it happens. And I'm going to be okay. And hopefully one day I'll be on here telling you that I had a baby. <laughs> but for now, even though I'm upset talking about it, it's because I've never sat down and told anyone the whole story. Not verbally. I have written about it, message friends and whatnot, but I've never verbally sat down. So I am okay. And I don't hold this grief as, well, this grief doesn't have as large a hold on me anymore. It's still there. But it's an experience now, not my whole experience. So that, that's me. That's my story. I hope that one person watching this feels that they are not alone and that they can talk about it and that time will heal the wounds you feel at the moment until next time though stay safe stay healthy and i'll see you in a video very soon and if i look like this it's because i filmed them in the wrong order <laughs> see you guys